Hey, Betty Klaus here. Okay, now, the, um, length of the video might seem a bit out of the norm. And it may seem a bit intimidating. Well, I, actually, intimidating may not be the word of the day. But whatever. Anyway, the video is pretty long here for one reason. And that reason is, I am here to give tribute to a channel that, unfortunately, for reasons unclear, I do have a um, guess as to what that reason is, but we won't get to that later. This was a YouTuber that went by the name of Christy o Misty. Christy o Misty released a seven-part series on feminism or feminazism as... Well, let's be true again. They're not real feminists. Anyway, um... I am here to pay special tribute to, um... Christian Misty and her views on feminism. So, like, because this se series is seven parts, that's why this video is so long. It's like an hour and something minutes. Well, anyway, um, as you may have noticed in the title of this, I do ask that you watch the video all the way through and really take in what she has to say, really absorb her points. And take her points on feminism into consideration. Because she hits the nail on the head when speaking out against feminism. Uh, that's all I have to say for now. Please enjoy Christy O. Misty's Fem Fe <laughs> Feminism Series. Feminism. That is our topic today. I know what you're thinking. Yes, I did just go there. We're going to delve into um, part one of a video series that I hope to do on feminism, what it is, uh, what the results have been, the consequences, um, the backlash, the male backlash, um, how it affects our families, our communities, our society as a whole, our entire country for that matter, and where it's coming from. Uh, first of all, I want to say that after all of this Wisconsin state capital business that I've been doing. Um, I've got some very, very thoughtful messages from people warning me about my safety. Um, thank you very much. I, uh, I, was, I was careful while I was there. I made sure I stayed by the cops most of the time. Um, although I don't know how much good it would have done me. I never know whose side they're on, but I made sure no one was following me home. You really never know with those guys. But no, came away from that without a scratch, except... Um, on my uh, my mental sanity. <laughs> okay, um, I also got a message, a very good reminder on my last video from a subscriber Pinegrove33, otherwise known as Bernard Chapin of Chapin's Inferno, a wandering cauldron of politically incorrect commentary. Definitely subscribe to him, he has some awesome stuff. Um, especially you guys, he's there for the guys. Um, he said, I think you should say nothing to them, as you can convince the left of zero. Isn't that the truth? We are in the market of persuading independents. Leftists are mental patients, not run-of-the-mill Democrats. Those freaks are leftist diehards, etc. So true. Um, good reminder, because in this culture war, in this political war, um, there are battles being fought on many fronts at the exact same time, and we need to wisely pick our battles. Um, so, thank you, sir, for that uh, reminder. All right, I saw a um, internet quote that goes, guys don't know how to treat girls anymore. I believe that's why the lesbian rate is going up. That's right, they don't know how to treat girls, and that's because everyone's telling them something different. Women themselves are giving them mixed signals. I would say that guys and girls don't know how to treat each other anymore, and there are many reasons for that. Is there anything guys don't get blamed for these days? Seriously, everything. Women's issues, family issues, national issues, it doesn't matter what it is, it's always men. 
Damn those male chauvinist pigs. I mean, really? Of all the cross-sections of society to blame these days for our problems, people act as if women haven't been liberated yet. As Phyllis Schlafly says, women are the most privileged creatures to ever walk the face of the earth, in this country, at least. I want to start off by jumping on the social bandwagon and saying, I'm offended. I am. Um, it seems like the thing to be is offended by something these days. Everything's offensive to someone, isn't it? You know, in the age of tolerance, everyone is more offended than ever. Personally, I'm offended by the term empowerment. It implies that I am lacking something on my own. I'm not good enough the way God made me. I don't need the National Organization for Women to tell me that I'm of worth as a human being. I don't need them. Um, I don't need feminists to make me feel decent about myself, to boost my confidence. I don't need a successful career even to feel fulfilled as a woman. All right, I want to read an interesting comment that someone posted in response to a comment that I posted on someone else's video titled, Feminists Beat Me Up on the Internet. <laughs> Funny and good and sad video, but uh, it was a rant by a blogger who um, was commentating on some of the comments he got on his blog. At any rate, I commented on his video and said, thanks for what you're doing, good job, um, voiced my disapproval of feminism. Some woman commented on my comment, and she says, and I quote, You're disgusting. One of those insecure women who is lacking in some regard, be it looks, intelligence, or otherwise, and so clings to the hope that you can be one of the guys by claiming to share the opinion of the most idiotic guys. I say only the most idiotic because most men I have met are feminists. They do believe that women are not, not lesser than men, which is all feminism is, obviously. Is that so? Well, you know, my first uh, reaction would have been to be indignant because of the just the stupidity of that statement, but honestly, I feel sorry for this woman. Um, she actually believes that feminism is about the belief that women are not lesser than men, which is not what it is. If it ever was about that, it's not anymore. <laughs> uh, so she needs to get educated. Second, um, one of those insecure women who's lacking in some regard, uh, you know, I am many things and insecure is not one of them. <laughs> uh, in fact, I would say that I often err on the other side. If anything, I'm too egotistical. Um, I'm sorry, but no one who knows me would ever label me insecure. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying that as a matter of fact. Um, looks, intelligence, or otherwise, you know, I know I'm not the hottest chick on the planet by a long shot. Uh, nor do I have a PhD, but I haven't, you know, I don't normally get criticism for my looks or my lack of intelligence. So, uh, she, you know, coming from someone who doesn't even know me, I just find it amusing. By the way, I understand the, the crowd that she's referring to when she talks about the women who are lacking in some regard and so hope to be one of the guys by siding with them against feminism. I know those types, I'm familiar with those types, they're the same kind of girl who will pretend to be, or will, who will act lesbian with her female friends because she thinks the guys find it hot. Yes, ultimately they're seeking the approval of the guys or want guys to be attracted to them so they become whatever it is that they feel that they want. She can't fathom, apparently, that I could disapprove of feminism because I believe that it's disastrous to our culture and because I believe it's a big fat lie. She thinks the only way I could actually be an anti-feminist is because I want guys to like me. Oh, I'm sorry to burst the old bubble here. So what is feminism anyway? Because there seems to be a great confusion, a great misunderstanding between people um, as to what it actually is. And what it was and what it is are two different things. And then what it is and what it is being sold as are two different things as well. Let me first say that feminism is not about women's rights or equal opportunity anymore. That may have be ha been how it started out. Um, yes, women weren't allowed to vote once upon a time. Feminism is now merely a tool 
of the liberal read socialist agenda. In order to fully understand how the socialists have hijacked the feminist movement, you need to understand that socialism and communism is not dead. There's not a lot of talk about communism anymore. The red scare of the 50s seems to be over. That's because it's been repackaged. It's being sold as something else. Exact same goals, exact same ideologies, exact same philosophies, different name. There isn't anything new under the sun. It's just relabeled, resold as something else. Um, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Political correctness is cultural Marxism. That's not insane to say. That's not wacko, that's not a little extreme. It's, it's a fact. Cultural Marxism has been repackaged and sold to the culture as political correctness because no one will accept, at least most of the country will not accept Marxism under that label, but they will if you call it political correctness. Call it something else, people swallow it whole. So the eventual goal of the liberals, the socialists, is socialism slash Marxism slash communism. Um, I know there are purists out there screaming at me right now, there are differences between those philosophies, they're not exactly the same. I know, I'm not an idiot, um, but they are all the same world view. They are. Same world view, slight technical differences, not anything um, significant. But anyway, fem feminism is one of the tools. Don't believe me? You should read The Naked Communist um, by Cleon Skousen. And in that book, they outline an agenda for transforming any society into a socialist society. One of their uh, one of their goals is to destroy the family because the the family is the framework, the foundation, a good family, the the nuclear family of a society. And one of their goals for destroying the family is to get behind the feminist movement because the communists felt that it had been very successful in creating discontent. Okay, so Betty Friedan, who wrote The Feminine Mystique back in the late 50s, I believe, uh, and yes, I've read it, she wrote it supposedly from the standpoint of a frustrated housewife. That's what she sold herself as. She espoused the ideologies which attack full-time homemakers, and she cultivates this victimology among women. And Later, she admitted that her propagandist views were linked to her belief in communism. She was a very strong communist, and she supported Stalin very strongly as well. Not surprising, radical feminism was the goal, one of the goals, of the socialists for bringing about their, their world view. If you are a feminist, and you think that the feminism you cling to is actually about you, actually about women's rights or even about women at all, guess what? You have been played. You've been lied to. Um, you're one of the useful idiots of whom Stalin spoke, um, who swallows the lie because it flatters you or it appeals to your sense of entitlement. I mean, think about it. If feminism was really about women, it would be about whatever women want, right? It would be about the freedom to pursue whatever you wanted, including nothing. It would include the freedom to stay home and raise your kids, if that's what you really wanted to do, if that was your heart's desire. But feminists are not for women. Again, Sarah Palin should have been championed by the National Organization for Women, right? Because she was running for president and she was a woman? Isn't that what feminists want? Women in leadership roles? No liberal women, which tells us that it's not about the woman, it's about the liberal. Uh, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's a matter of science and of common sense. Um, specific actions have specific consequences, but women have gullibly believed, actually believed, that the lie that they can take action, certain actions with no reaction, the lie that they do not have choices to make, they can have it all. You can't have it all. Women actually think that they can have everything they want, when they want it, and men are supposed to know what and when that is. 
Feminists want to be totally independent except when they're feeling dependent. And if men don't then step up and allow themselves to be depended on at said time, then they're insensitive jerks. Women want to act unlovable but be loved. Uh, to let it all hang out, but how dare men notice? Actually, they'd better notice, but not too much because that makes them creeps. See what I'm saying? Women want to be fully self-reliant, headstrong, in need of nothing, especially not men, of course, yet they also want to be fought for and pursued and protected and cherished. And ultimately, what women want, what feminists want, radical feminists, is to be able to act like men and be treated like women. There's a scene in The Dukes of Hazard, the new movie, where Daisy Duke, when she's working as a waitress, um, some guy is ogling her chest area. And she says, best be looking at my name tag, friend. When he then makes a comment about her very obvious boobage, she punches him and kicks him over. To me, that epitomizes feminism more than anything. I'm going to be who I want to be, which is unfeminine, unladylike, but you're going to treat me like a lady. I'm going to dress in a manner that makes you think that I'm a hooker, but I expect you to treat me like I'm a respectable person. Am I the only one who thinks this is insane? Today I'm just trying to help define feminism. There's a lot that I missed. A lot that will probably come out in my following videos, but I really wanted to get this up. Thank you again for watching, and I look forward to the hailstorm of angry comments. Feminism Part 2, The Death of Distinction. Hi, I'm Christiana, and I'm back with um, another installment in our series on feminism. Um, today, I want to talk about the, the death of, of the differences between the genders. And uh, I, I think it's absolutely detrimental to society. It's detrimental to our culture. Completely destroys the relationships between men and women, whether it be friendships or relationships, marriage. It just destroys the way we relate to each other. It affects everything. Feminists make the grave mistake of thinking that equality is synonymous with sameness. Let me say that again. Feminists define equality as sameness. They wouldn't officially define it that way. That's how they view it. Um, that's, that's messed up. I'm sorry, but it is. I say men and women are equal, but different meaning of equal worth, of equal va value, but different roles. When I say that to feminists, and I made the mistake of saying this, standing up and saying it in a current events class of mine, my senior year of high school, I got lambasted for the statement, and I was told that saying men and women are equal but different is the same as saying separate but equal, as was the catchphrase back in the days of segregation between blacks and whites. Equal but different makes total sense. If you look at everything around us, anything can be used as an example. I like to use the example of a camshaft and a crankshaft. Both absolutely necessary to make the thing run, but completely different. Different roles, they're doing different things. The camshaft doesn't whine because it can't be a crankshaft, and vice versa. No one looks down on one and says, well, that can't do the job of the other one, so it's inferior. No, they're both necessary. They both complement each other, but they're completely different. Um, you can look at it in terms of reproduction, too. Uh, in order to make a baby, you need an egg and you need a sperm. And they're completely different, and their roles are different. They're not doing the same thing. Both necessary. Without the one, without the other, there's going to be no baby. I recently heard a feminist remark that uh, she was admitting that men and women are different, and she said, and I guess we probably have, maybe, have different wiring too, mental wiring probably as well. Are you serious? We are completely different, mentally, physically, all of it. 
Uh, I'm reading a book right now called The Decline of Men by Guy Garcia. And he talks about how the differences between men and women are so pronounced that it almost renders them a, a different species, if you want to look at it that way. The goal of the feminist movement and of society in general these days is to, to make men and women interchangeable. Take away the differences. It doesn't matter who stays at home and raises the kids. It doesn't matter who is the breadwinner. It doesn't matter who fights the wars. It doesn't matter who nurtures the babies. It can be either one. That, my friends, is perversity. It flies in the face of, of the way we were created. It flies in the face of nature. And we're seeing the consequences of it. People should be able to see the consequences, but no. They attribute it to everything but the actual cause. And that is men and women, mostly women, shucking their God-given roles and saying, I'm going to be something else. In all of nature, there are checks and balances. In every relationship, whether it be a friendship or a marriage, there's always one who's more the leader and one who's more the follower. Have you ever noticed that? If you haven't, just try, you know, try checking it out. Any, any two close friends, for example, same gender friends even, or a marriage, one person in the marriage is going to be more the leader, one's going to be more the follower. Now, it's, it's in varying degrees. Sometimes it's very pronounced and obvious, sometimes very much more subtle. Nevertheless, there is a difference. You're never going to be completely, exactly at the same level of leadership or control. Leadership is male. I'm going to say that right now, and I've probably offended a whole bunch of people. Leadership is a masculine trait. I know that's not being taught anymore. Nobody, you know, the public school system has successfully convinced women that leadership is not a gender quality. It's it's something that anyone can do. It's something that women should especially be doing. I'm not saying a woman can't lead, but leadership is inherently a masculine trait. And it has been proven that men are better at it, and I won't get into right now exactly why that is because I don't really have time. So I always find it funny when I see a marriage where the wife will brag that that they're friends, they're really good friends. She'll say, you know, we don't have the typical marriage. We're 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 best buddies. We're not, um, uh, you know, he's not this overbearing chauvinist pig. I'm not a you know a feminist brat. We get along great. Usually I look over and the guy is sitting there looking whipped. The woman's saying, we have an equal relationship. What she means is, I'm in charge. She doesn't realize it, but to her, her being in charge makes it equal. So, there are checks and balances in all of nature. And I wanted to read an excerpt for you from this book that I'm reading called, uh, as I said before, The Decline of Men by Guy Garcia. He went and had lunch, an interview with... Um, the CEO of an owner, I think of Time Warner, named uh, Richard Parsons. He told me about an epiphany he had had during an African safari he had recently taken to celebrate his 50th birthday. And I quote from here on. We came upon this pride of lions, he recalled, two big males, about nine female lions, and a few cubs. And every time we would roll up, the females were engaged in some sort of activity, looking after the cubs, cleaning them up, or they were hunting, preparing the food, or eating. The cubs were always playing, that's what they do, and the males were always sleeping. Always! You know, you want a picture of a lion sitting up there roaring, so I asked the guide, what's up with these guys? They're asleep all the time. And he said, you've got to understand, this is nature, and everybody's got a role, and they have theirs. And their role is, one, to procreate, and two, when the bad guys show up, they get up and go to war and protect the pride. And it was a very simple thing, don't ask me why, it just sort of hit me like a bolt. In nature, you don't think about it. You just do what nature dictates. Everyone has a role. And that's their role. And if you risk weight things, yeah, the females are always busy and they seem to be working harder and doing stuff, but it's all very low-risk stuff. The guys don't do much, but when they do something, it's all high-risk stuff. If you weigh it all out at the end, it about balances out. It's the balance of nature. Um, here's the book, by the way decline of men. Um, I just found that very, um, very profound. That illustrates things very well, because a lot of times I hear that used by feminists to say men and males, including animals, are chauvinist, you know, by nature, because the male is the stronger one. 
he's going to be the dominant one, and so he makes the women work, and he just sits and he sleeps. Look at history. Men overwhelmingly, almost entirely, all the bloodshed has been on the part of men. Men are the ones who have sacrificed historically their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor. Everything that has ever been risked that was worth something was usually by men. I'm not saying women haven't made strides in history. I'm saying that men were always the ones sacrificing because they believed in chivalry. In my opinion, um, I have observed that there are three different kinds of chivalry now. And by three different types, I mean three different motives behind men who are chivalrous or gentlemanly towards women. And um, the first, I would say, is duty. You know, you were taught as a young boy, open the door for the woman or, you know, act like a gentleman. It's just you were you were that's the way you're taught, so you do it. Whether you feel like it or not, that's just you think that's what you're supposed to be, so you do it. Um, second reason, because they want something. Admiration, respect, appreciation, or you know, to get a woman in bed with them. It, the reasons vary, but there are guys out there who will play the nice guy, um, even when they're not, in order to uh, to get women. And the third reason, which is the only reason, in my opinion, to be chivalrous, is when men want to. And women need to take note of this, because men who sacrifice for women on purpose, because they want to, do it as a reaction to women being women. It's when they see vulnerability that they step in and they protect you. To demand that a man sacrifice for you and protect you and be there for you and you're not fulfilling your side of things is the most stupid, unreasonable thing. When women act like women, men act like men. Not always, but in general. There's something about a woman who is not fighting her God-given femininity and she's accepted it. She's cultivating her femininity. And I don't mean in a warped, twisted way, you know, the high-maintenance woman or the, the slut, you know, that's, that's a twisted version of femininity. I mean real, pure womanliness as God intended it that makes, it brings out the best in men. It always does. Now, it brings out the worst in a bad guy, and she's going to need somebody to protect her, but in a good guy, it brings out the best of him. His protective qualities and his, just his manliness. I've lived extensively in the Middle East, and um, I lived for half a year in Egypt. And when I was in Egypt in particular, I took great note of this, because it's impossible not to notice. The differences between men and women are huge. Men and women are separated in churches on either side of the aisle. They don't sit next to each other on public transportation, on buses. They won't sit on the same, um, they won't even sit on the same bench if they can help it. There are not a whole lot of male-female friendships. You really don't see that. And I think that's not necessarily a good thing. I think it's a good thing to have guarded male-female friendships. I mean, it's good to cultivate those, but they don't go all crazy like Americans and cultivate these opposite gender best friendships that we see, which by the way are ridiculous and they lead to heartbreak and you know, one person's thinking a relationship, one person's thinking I view you as a brother and yeah. And it's true that in the Middle East there is some chauvinism, actually there's a lot of chauvinism. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the Arab male stereotype. But I found it, I have to say, my time there, so refreshing. That's the number one thing that I came away with when I came home from there. Sometimes I just want to go back. Because there are those Arab men who view women as second-class citizens. Literally, you're not of as much worth as I am because you're born a female. And if you're a man, you'll be more valuable. But there is also a lot of just recognition that we are different. 
and that I can't even begin to put into words how beautiful that is and how beautiful it was to experience I remember one time um, a group and I were walking home from church most of the traveling is done on foot and so um, whether you're traveling on foot or not you always have at least one guy if not more in the group girls never you know rarely travel alone and sometimes they do but always in a group anyway the guys split up into different groups to go with us As usual on the streets of Egypt the guys um, on this on the streets began heckling us and harassing us and you know yelling out propositions and such became very very accustomed to it when I was there but what touched me then and for a long time afterward and even now when I think about it was that when that happened the guys in our group I mean the guys in our group were on the verge of brawling in the street they were so angry and it wasn't out of a sense of chivalrous duty it was because we were women and we were being harassed and they felt like protecting us as simple as that despite all the supposed drawbacks and disadvantages of a patriarchal society one thing I can say is that I never had to explain myself or apologize for being a woman and acting like a woman because they understood it and they, they didn't just understand it they expected it in America there is this huge loss of respect between the sexes no more an appreciation of each other there's no more a need for each other we're being told that we can both do the same job just as well as the other okay why is there any point in being a man or a woman after all greetings and welcome back today we have drum roll please part three of the feminism series which we're going to call manhood criminalized now not only is feminism a crime against men it's also a huge disaster for women whether they recognize it or not but today we're going to be talking about how it affects men feminism seeks to among other things um, stamp out masculinity and make males obsolete very little grieves me to the soul more than this the the war on the genders it's absolutely criminal now I don't know if you've noticed this or not but the white straight American male is the most used made fun of discriminated against individual in America and perhaps the world some of them know it all too well and too many of them do not it's just how things are boys growing up today don't know what's going on behind the scenes all they know is that they're frustrated they're being smashed down they're being told that what they have to offer is not needed they run off every day to be indoctrinated by a public school system that tells them that they need to calm down and sit down and shut up not take the lead how dare you display energy of any sort especially not wild rambunctious energy dang you must have ADD let's put you on Ritalin and we're definitely seeing a decline in men if you want to put it that way it's statistically proven Guy Garcia documents this a little bit in his book the decline of men as I've already read from before he says three decades ago boys and girls read and wrote at roughly the same level today an 11th grade boy writes and reads at the level of an 8th grade girl in 2007 for the first time in the 65 year history of the National Science Awards the 40 finalists were equally divided between the boys and girls 40 years ago three-quarters of all college graduates were men women now make up more than half of all college students and are gaining Equally telling is the fact that women now earn a majority of diplomas in fields that men used to dominate. Female college students now outnumber men in biology and business and have reached numerical in law, medicine, and optometry up from 22% just a generation ago. In 2006, women were already earning the majority of bachelor's degrees in the biological and social sciences, education, psychology, math, and agriculture. Even as the female to male population ratio in the U.S. has remained stable at about 51 to 49 percent, respectively, the number of women enrolled in undergraduate classes has grown at double the rate for men. The story is largely one of progress for women and stagnation for men. And of course, the feminists applaud and the socialists applaud, but much of society and many women 
aren't liking it. And they're asking why. How did this happen? Why are men suddenly just stepping down? Let me put it this way. I grew up on a farm for almost all of my childhood. And um, castration is a horrible thing. Whenever it was time to castrate the calves, I didn't want to be involved. I usually had to be. I had to help hold them down or something, but I didn't want to look. It was terrible. And let me tell you, you do not castrate a bull calf and expect it not to act like a steer. Guy Garcia says on the dilemma of the American male, and I quote, If he clings to traditional notions of masculinity, he is derided as a clueless caveman. But the moment he deviates from the masculine norm, he is lambasted for being a feminized sissy. That pretty much sums it up. Every voice which is heralded by our society is encouraging women to ste step up, to take the lead, to succeed, to progress, and they're holding men back. This is no longer about equal opportunity. It's about smashing the one and elevating the other. Then, of course, the backlash is that while the feminists and the socialists applaud, many women are saying, I didn't bargain for this, including feminists. They're saying, wait, that was kind of nice at the beginning, but wait a second. That means now I'm in charge. I have to do it all. Ah, 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 ah. There is a definite, definite war against men. And the goal is to make men obsolete. It sickens me even to say it. It reminds me of a scene from Indiana Jones. It belongs in a museum. So do you. Men are ultimately being told that they're a thing of the past. Wake up. It's the 21st century. We're modern now. We don't need you. We're past the Stone Age, the Bronze Age. Society has been restructured so that women's strengths are the ones that are needed the communication, the networking skills, whatever else that, that women are usually stronger in, the verbal, you know, whatever. Typically, generally, that's what society is saying that they need. Think of the, most of the available jobs out there. The jobs which most women would never be able to do are being weeded out. And that's one of the horrible reasons that women can't appreciate men anymore is because they don't know a world, a real world. Women only know a world that is protected from reality by technology. Think about it. If everything that technology helps women with was to go down, if we were to return to the days of settling the frontier, women would all of a sudden realize, oh my goodness, we need men. Isn't that selfish? Now, I think my farm upbringing helps me to appreciate this a little bit more because when you live out in the middle of nowhere and you live off of the land and you work for everything that you eat and everything that you earn and you're working with your bare hands, everything by the sweat of your brow, that is a man's world. So yeah, the goal is to make men obsolete. I got a comment on my... Um, on my Feminism Part 2 video from YouTube user Hands On Communication. He says, thanks for this. I've also noticed that to varying degrees men are largely becoming obsolete, which is going to have a very adverse effect on society if not already. I would definitely say already. We have done away with male role models in the elementary school system. Fathers get routinely screwed over in custody cases. And thanks to ye old sperm bank, women can make a conscious de decision to render fathers obsolete too. Indeed, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. My dad was a student of military history, and as a strapping young man, he decided to go the military route, thinking that um, the military of the early 80s was at least at its core the same as it used to be, as it always has been. He thought it was the one way to escape from the deathly clutches of feminism and into the last bastion of hope where being a male was actually appreciated, indeed, necessary and essential rather than demonized. He discovered how wrong that was in Army ROTC. He quickly discovered that even in the military, which is supposed to be about defending the country, which is supposed to need strength, they didn't want it. They didn't want strength, they didn't want courage, they didn't want bravado. They mocked him for being a hero. Women were assigned the leadership positions in the graduation parade. They were always helping and elevating and pushing the women forward, all the while telling people via the media that the women were succeeding excellently. 
the fact that they have to be pushed forward and helped and propped up, would that not tell you that perhaps they're not as successful as they're being made out to be? It's crazy. Think about our military academies today. It's so difficult to get into a military academy, let's say West Point, today. If you are a guy, it's incredibly difficult to get in. If you're a girl, you have a, such a better chance. Thank you, affirmative action, for that. Which means that you can be a guy who outscores, outtests, outrates a woman who gets accepted, but you won't be accepted because you're a man and they need women. And when I say need, I mean to fill quotas. How messed up is that? Where can men go anymore to be men? To hone their masculinity? To be with the guys? Think about it. Where is there any more that society, that the feminists have not gone after? There is no place that they are content to leave alone. Let me think. Let me think. The military? Nope, we already went there. Maybe some of the protective service, like law enforcement. Oh, no, no, lots of women cops. What about firefighters? No, no, it doesn't matter if you can drag that 300-pound person out of the burning building or not. You're going to get to be a firefighter because you're a woman. Hmm, maybe American football, right? That's the most male and most American thing there is. Oh, wait, no. Even in my little hometown, there were several girls on the 8th grade guys' football team. Now, now there's a reason it's 8th grade. If they tried to play with the high school boys, oh, boy. Let's see. Sensitive teenage girl, or even butch teenage girl, meets volcano of male testosterone. Yeah, she's getting killed. Feminists are these clutching, clawing, grabbing, selfish little things, big things, which aren't content to let men have anything to themselves, or even to share anything with men. It's like, oh, oh my goodness, there's an area where women haven't stuck their sticky little fingers. Let's go there and mess it up. All the time I hear girls and women complain about men and their video game obsession. You know, what is it about video games? You're sitting there and you're moving your fingers and nothing else and you're playing a game that isn't real, right? That's what they say. And you can do it for hours on end. Did anyone ever think that maybe it's because that's the one place they're allowed to go, they're allowed to be a man, they're allowed to fight, they're allowed to succeed without the interference of women? And not really so much anymore. And it's pathetic that men have been regulated to that. This doesn't really go with the flow here, but I often hear feminists say that men can be feminists too, or I know a lot of men who are feminists, and that always chaps my hide because, duh, of course they're feminists. The public schools have them from infancy, practically. You know, little six, seven-year-old boy, earlier they do preschool, and he's indoctrinated from the time he can't even read or write. Of course he's going to be a feminist. He's been programmed to believe that if he's not, that he's evil. Boys are being programmed to think that there is something wrong with them, and that they deserve whatever they get in terms of regulation or being held back. As subscriber Quan Kicker said, Feminists make men ashamed of their masculinity. They use bogus studies and bad science to convince men they are inherently violent, evil, and physically and mentally inferior to women. Sound familiar? It's the same tactics the Nazi party used to convince people that Aryans were superior and that Jews were inferior. Feminism is modern Nazism, and the West has become nothing short of one giant female supremacist society where men are considered less than human. Now, people always get mad when anyone compares feminism to Nazism, or, you know, feminazis. I really like that term, by the way, feminazis. Um, but it's actually accurate. It's like when I bring up communism slash socialism and feminism together, and people get in a huff about it. Why? I'm not saying it to be spiteful. I'm saying it because it's true, because they actually genuinely are linked. Feminists like to think that the men's movement consists of these regressive dinosaurs who just can't let go of the ideas of the past. Hmm, if that's true, let me ask why so many of these men are not old, and second, why is the movement growing? Okay, this has all the characteristics of a backlash, not of people clinging to old notions. The men's movement is simply men finally standing up and saying, 
we're not going to take any more of being trampled over, spat on, and told to sit down and shut up. That's all it is. It's a response. Remember that whole thing we were talking about? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Specific a actions have specific consequences. Feminists? These are the consequences. I said this before, but men are being told what they can and cannot be attracted to. Women are turning into these unisex, if not masculine, creatures, and then being surprised, angry, and hurt when men pass them by in favor of a more feminine woman. Many times I've heard a feminist bemoan having lost her man. She disregards that fact as if it has nothing to do with his reason for choosing the other woman over her. But then she'll say, and she's so sweet. It's said with both disgust and regret and a little envy. How about affirmative action to get more males into college? After all, they're now in the minority. We said we needed affirmative action to get males, or excuse me, females and minorities into college when they were in the minority. Now males are in the minority. Why aren't we doing something? We know for a fact that feminists are not all about equality because if they were, they would look at all of the inequities now. But no, they keep pushing for more. It's not about equality. It never has been. Well, as usual, I didn't cover even half the ground I wanted to. For watching and for commenting, for your overwhelming support and encouragement, by the way, I did not at all expect this when I started. Tune for part four, which will be Women Sold Short, and we're going to take a look at how feminism kills women. See you next time. Welcome back to the No Feminist Zone. I'm Christiana, and I'm here with part four of the feminism series. This one is going to be called Women Sold Short. We're going to be talking about the damage that feminism has done to women. Recently, a YouTube subscriber posted my feminism series to a different website. It warned me that it was a liberal website, but where better to post them, right? Despite all the flack. I read a comment on my manhood criminalized video by a woman who says the following at the end of her comments. She just sounds misogynistic, which is strange as she's a woman. I can just sense the bafflement. But the things she say sound like things a male misogynist would say. She sounds like a four-year-old guy who has been married for a while and he's complaining about how his wife has him by the nuts. End quote. So why indeed? Why do I feel the need to speak out against feminism? I'll tell you one thing, it has nothing to do with wanting anti-feminist guys to like me. I believe feminism not only oppresses men, but it also gives women the short end of the stick. Women are being told that it's about them, and it's not. It's not about their rights. So with that, let's get started.
song gives me chills still and long before Bonnie Tyler sang about needing a hero women have needed heroes deep down women want real men and men do not allow them to tell you anything different sure we love the modern male we love him in the same way that we love a puppy or a baby women are starting to look around and say where are the real men where are the William Wallace's what happened and it's really heartbreaking this whole war on the genders it's like watching something die you know it gets sicker and sicker and weaker and weaker until finally it dies or is bled out as one person commented on a video of mine now first of all feminism attacks women who want to make a choice other than the career choice when I was 18 and brand new to Facebook an acquaintance of mine who worked with me in Civil Air Patrol which is the auxiliary of the Air Force added me on Facebook and I had made the grave mistake apparently of my views on feminism in my about me section this girl copied pasted and posted my views on feminism onto the wall of a mutual acquaintance of ours and then commented on it can you believe this how effing pathetic can you believe there are still women out there who think like this over and over again she said it was pathetic and it was sad and she was really angry over it and at the time I wondered what it was that ticked her off so much because we didn't even know each other actually we were just acquaintances and there was nothing per about me personally that she hated it was just that she hated my stance on feminism feminists hate it and take it personally when other women have views other than their own we saw this recently on the old Turks video where Anna attacks Phil Schlafly and um, vehemently states that all feminism is is giving women the freedom to choose between being let's say a homemaker and a tra in a traditional role or taking a career path feminism does not give women the freedom to choose homemakers do not feel free to be homemakers society does not make mothers feel free to stay home and raise their children if anything feminists demonize and criminalize it they make you feel like you're not contributing to society and you're a lazy bum so why are traditional women and women who choose that path vilified and attacked well two main reasons in my opinion the first one is it messes with the agenda if there are still women out there who are traditional women and clinging to traditional roles there are definitely men out there who don't mind it in fact who prefer it and that thwarts the feminist agenda of stamping out such ideas and such people the second reason kind of ties in and that is jealousy women are being told that they can have both and be both but they're finding that a lot of men go for the women who haven't fallen for that lie let me quote mr. juve who commented on a YouTube video of mine feminism deserves to have a negative connotation it's career oriented and serves to diminish the role of a woman who finds fulfillment in household and motherly duties it has the approach of you're young and beautiful you should get a job have a career get a life once you've got that then you can settle down and have kids and it is within that approach that it's insinuated that women who want to be a mom at a young age don't want to live and so what they do is diminished by their own sex that is so true the overwhelming majority of all the hatred I've received for my views on feminism has been from other women other women who supposedly are for my rights and my right to choose go figure that one out Robin a boy says Phyllis Schlafly is exactly right women are told you can have it all you can sleep with a thousand men and not be considered a slut you can treat men like crap and still marry the man of your dreams you can be a career woman and rise to management positions and still have kids in your thirties this is complete bull feminism has done more to harm women than they will ever know women certainly can and do find fulfillment in things like a job and other activities that they do outside the home but they will never be fulfilled as a woman through their career like a man would and even feminists recognize that that's why they tell women you can have both you can have the family life and the career but it's not true you cannot successfully have both of course everyone defines success differently don't they and man the backlash I recently read a comment on a YouTube video 
of a man who said, I will never marry an American woman, exclamation point. And who can blame him? But it certainly doesn't bode well for those American women who are but a few good apples in a barrel of rotten ones. Men wisely decide that fishing through all the rotting stink isn't worth it, and they're finding another barrel. For you men watching, women love strong men, and don't let any woman tell you otherwise. Because there are those who will. Women thought they wanted men that they could control until they got it. And they realized that was not what they bargained for. I mean, have you ever wondered why the girls unjustly go for the bad guys? By the way, I'll be doing a video on nice guys and bad boys, but not as a part of this series, probably. Whether a woman admits it or not, she does not want a man that she can control. She may say that, she may think that, she may rebel against a man who doesn't let her walk all over him, but that's what she wants. I know, women don't make much sense. A woman cannot respect a man who she can control. Women may think or even say that they like the Alan Alda version of masculinity, but they like it because it can be controlled. There's nothing attractive about it, though. A man who can be overpowered by a woman will make a power-hungry feminist woman happy in that area, but he's definitely not going to be able to make her weak in the knees, or make her feel secure and protected, and so many other things that there just aren't words to describe. I mean, admit it, ladies, if you've ever seen this full scene, that you didn't fully appreciate what was going on. You make it so difficult sometimes. I do, I really do. You could be a little nicer, though. Come on, admit it. Sometimes you think I'm all right. Occasionally, maybe, when you aren't acting like a scoundrel. Scoundrel? Scoundrel? You like me because I'm a scoundrel. There aren't enough scoundrels in your life. I happen to like nice men. I'm a nice man. Very nice. The thing is, our society, greatly influenced by the feminist agenda, of course, has grossly misdefined what it means to be a jerk. Any display of aggressiveness or dominance or initiative or leadership by a man seems to be booed by the masses as a bad thing. Well, ladies, let's hear from you. And next time I'll be back with a video titled, Confessions of a G.I. Jane. I have some interesting stories. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, commenting, liking, and just appreciating. Greetings and welcome to part 5 of the feminism series, which I've titled Confessions of a G.I. Jane. First of all, I apologize for the long sabbatical between videos. I just made a very unexpected trip out of state, as a matter of fact, several states away. I am in the south. Now, before we get started, I'd like to say that I failed to summarize very well in my last video. Uh, but the reason for pointing out the lack of heroes was to establish the link between the feminist agenda and the decrease of real men. Um, you probably got that if you've been watching my other videos, but I just wanted to clarify because there seemed to be a lot of confusion. For example, I got a channel comment from a man who will re remain nameless because he later apologized to me for his comment and cleared up the misunderstanding. To me, it was just another indicator that there are so many men who have been so burned and so shamed and treated so unjustly by feminists out there that they don't trust even anti-feminist women. They assume that they're selling something, that they're just as selfish as every other feminist out there, that they can't possibly actually have the interests of both men and women at heart. And who can blame them? Now, I used the movie clips that I did because they portray men who embody a non-warped version of masculinity. Not because they largely happen to be in war movies or violent movies, and not because they happen to be good looking. Now, it's Hollywood. Everything Hollywood produces is generally going to have highly attractive individuals in it. That does not change the fact that I chose those clips based on the characters portrayed and not on their appearances. Anyway, through all of the flack, I have developed a great affinity for the remove button on YouTube. With a single click I can delete a foul and offensive post 
and I also have a an even greater appreciation for all those who come out in support of uh, women and men who oppose feminism and the support that you've shown me has been absolutely overwhelming. I can't even tell you how much it means and I try to get back to as many people as I possibly can but sometimes life gets in the way and I don't always have the time that I would like to respond. Just know that I do see everything that you post and I do appreciate it immensely. Now on to today's video, Confessions of a G.I. Jane. This is completely unscripted, unplanned, no notes. I just wanted to share with you some personal experiences with feminism in certain jobs I went into which I expected to be in the minority and if anything discriminated against and found it quite to the opposite. That because I was in the minority I was esteemed and upheld and actually given unfair advantages and privileges for being a woman. You're probably wondering about the G.I. Jane title. No, I was never in the Army. I was and am, however, in the Civil Air Patrol, which is the official auxiliary of the United States Air Force, which is a very fancy sounding title, but ultimately we are not, quote, real military. We do not deploy. We are not combat trained. We really do search and rescue. 95% uh, of all inland search and rescue missions in the country are performed by Civil Air Patrol. We uh, carry out Air Force assigned search and rescue missions. We have a cadet program which trains youth in military customs and courtesies, drill, marching, PT, you know, the physical side of things, aerospace education, a lot of that. No, we're not like the Boy Scouts. Nothing against them. Now, I joined Civil Air Patrol at the age of 16. Growing up, I had heard about the military a lot and I was raised with an emphasis on character more than almost anything else. I really wanted to serve my country and ultimately I wanted an outlet for that character. I wanted to do something that actually needed it, where it would count for something, where it would actually help people. And despite everything that I'm going to say in this video, don't get me wrong, Civil Air Patrol is great, it is a great mission, and it's good for young people, so you should really check it out. However. My time in Civil Air Patrol merely served to confirm what I had been taught about feminism and what I had observed elsewhere. I had gone in with feminism not on my mind whatsoever and very quickly realized that it was alive and well there. Girls weren't merely given the opportunity to succeed. It became very apparent to me very quickly that it was important and good that women achieve. They didn't really care about the guys as much. A male and a female could be promoted to the same rank and the female is the one who would get the attention because she was a girl, because it was novel, because she was supposed to, because it was cool, because it was politically correct, because it furthered the feminist agenda, because of whatever reason on which you might want to speculate. And this bothered me because it was clearly a little demeaning to the guys, but also because it was humiliating to me. I started to wonder, you know, how badly would I have to fail before I was recognized as failing? Now, for the record, I was a very good cadet. I loved my job, and I succeeded, which I applied myself to. I promoted through and to the cadet officer ranks very quickly. I enjoyed learning and taking tests and doing my job, and a lot of the, the badges and achievements and promotions and such were objective rather than subjective, so I knew it wasn't that I was being promoted because I was a female. But there were some which were subjective and that always caused me to wonder. And even when it came to promotions, I started to take a look at the physical fitness tests. As the auxiliary of the Air Force and wearing the Air Force uniform as we do and such, our PT tests kind of followed the Air Force's uh, grading system. So it involved push-ups, sit-ups, sit and reach, uh, a shuttle run, which is, is a sprint basically, and then also a timed mile run. I know, one mile. So when I was a cadet second lieutenant, I think it was, I was chosen to be the primary representative for my squadron at the Cadet Advisory Council, which is kind of like the Congress of Civil Air Patrol. The regulations and run the cadet program, create policy. During the time, I took a close look at the PT standards. And it wasn't the fact that the male and the female standards were different that shocked me. Anyone with common sense would recognize that males are almost always going to outperform females physically, very physically different, thus the standards were different, and I didn't tackle that specifically. It wasn't the difference that, that bothered me. It was the enormous gap of difference between the requirements. The requirements changed based on your, your age, 
uh, the promotion you were going for, and your gender. And I was looking at one particular phase for one particular promotion. A male of a certain age had to run a mile in, I think it was just under seven minutes or just over seven minutes, let's say seven something. And a female of the same age had to run it in ten something, ten plus. Now first of all, I can walk a mile in ten something minutes. But second, that kind of a difference isn't taking male and female differences simply into account. It's giving the females an enormous edge on the males. Let's put it a different way. There isn't a female out there, or at least in Civil Air Patrol, or so I hope, who couldn't run the mile, or perhaps even walk it, in ten something minutes. But there are plenty of males who were failing the seven something standard. Not because the males were more out of shape, either. That was the other thing. There were plenty of overweight females who were passing and promoting. In other words, it demanded a higher level of fitness from males, even taking into account the fact that male and female levels of physical fitness would be different. Okay, I had to play with the settings there for a minute. As the sun goes down, I'm losing my light. So, at the next Cadet Advisory Council meeting, I asked them to table that issue female PT standards. That's actually how it read on the agenda, female PT standards. And I brought to bear all the incriminating evidence and was met with the typical comeback, which is that females are anatomically different, no kidding, and thus they need more of an edge in order to promote. Keep in mind that I wasn't even tackling the fact that the standards were different here. I was not arguing that females should have the same, same standards as males, although it could be argued that if the males need to be at that standard in order to do a certain jobs, then should not the females also? But here I was just saying, let's look at how grossly different these are. The fact is, I said, we're giving females an advantage over the males. We're promoting plenty of incompetent and physically out of shape females and denying promotion to plenty of males who would easily pass the female standards and in fact would almost pass their own. And I was met with the most ridiculous feedback. I got absolutely pummeled from all sides. There were very few who supported me. A few guys saw the logic of what I was saying but didn't really speak up. There was one female in particular, and it's funny because she's now at the Air Force Academy. She's the one who used the females are anatomically different than males excuse. And I said, yeah, I understand, but look, I mean, seriously, a three-minute difference on a mile, if you are a runner, you would know is enormous. It's astonishing. I was told, well, this is based off of Air Force PT standards slash the Presidential Fitness Challenge. And I made the argument that, well, that's nice, but if the Presidential Fitness Challenge causes us to unfairly give an advantage to females, and disadvantaged males, we need to take another look at it. We don't accept the status quo because it is the status quo. Since when do we accept how things are for the sake of how things are? And finally they tried flattering me and saying, well, not all women are as physically fit as you, and not everybody is a marathon runner, which I was not at that time, by the way. I later did run an extreme trail marathon, but at that time wasn't into long distance running at all. And that was perhaps the first time that I felt the fires of indignation absolutely welling up inside of me. As I saw these people, you know, chuckling to themselves and passing it off as a, well, you're just really physically fit. That really irritated me because they were using every trick in the book to excuse this female supremacy doctrine. And it was like the emperor who wore no clothes. For all of my insisting and for all the evidence I brought out, and all the logic, all the facts, all the statistics, none of it mattered to them. And they pitched it out the window and pitched me off of the agenda without a single supporting document except perhaps the presidential fitness challenge and told me never to bring it up again. Apparently it would have been too much work. Well, yeah, sometimes revolution is a lot of work. Sometimes the truth isn't fun to hear. Sometimes it's not simple to implement. That doesn't make it any less the truth. That incident really helped to open my eyes to the reality of the evils of feminism. And suddenly I started to see things I hadn't really seen before. Every time I would you know, earn a promotion, every time I would earn an award, 
I would scoop up honor flight or, you know, the honors at an encampment at training. It was immediately a big thing. I had many officers tell me I was the poster child of Civil Air Patrol, that I had it all, that I was the model cadet. And while I was good at what I did and passionate about what I did, I couldn't help but feel that a lot of it did have to do with the fact that I was a female, because I knew guys who were succeeding as much as I was and not getting quite the same amount of recognition. The other thing about Civil Air Patrol, and especially the cadet program, was its emphasis on leadership. And women were pushed to lead so much more than the guys, in my opinion. But I cannot count the number of instances where I saw women pushed forward and guys held back. It wasn't enough for women to do their part. It wasn't enough for women to contribute. They had to be out in the lead. They had to be running the show. And there were all too many guys who were completely fine with that. Again, if you hear a lie long enough, it starts to become truth in your mind. I'm no longer a cadet in Civil Air Patrol, by the way, but I am an officer. I'm the public affairs officer for my squadron. So I write news articles and take pictures and ultimately make Civil Air Patrol look good, ironically enough. Now, one of my reasons in sharing all this was to simply share my experiences with feminism. But another reason is because a lot of the flack I've gotten from feminists has been shot at me with the assumption and sometimes even the statement that... I'm old-fashioned, I must not have any independence whatsoever, I must not have a personality, I must not have a mind of my own. Well, clearly, come on, I'm doing videos on feminism on YouTube. That I neither want nor am capable of living a life outside the home and of raising children, and that ultimately my opinion is rooted in me being naive and in whatever I've been taught. Those who know me and know some of my adventures would know that none of that could be further from the truth. I have held jobs that the majority of women will never hold in areas which women do not ordinarily occupy. I've proven myself to be capable and sometimes even more capable than the men I have worked with. Other than that, I have witnessed discrimination against plenty of men who should have passed me up and didn't, not because their own lack of ambition or their, or their own lack of capability or leadership, but because the system and the agenda was holding them back. People also like to believe that it's different in the military and it is not. In fact, it's become quite the hotbed of feminism. A large number, and perhaps the majority of my friends, I would say, are in the military. And the stories I hear from them are appalling. Guys and girls alike. The push for women to succeed and the consequent lowering of the standards has ultimately resulted in the question, gender equality or combat effectiveness, which god do we serve? And America has clearly made her choice. And the next video, part six, which will be next to last in this series, will be focusing on the backlash of feminism. Thanks for your support and your graciousness. Continue to speak out against feminism and to think freely without the aid of social programming. This is Christiana saying good night and God bless you. Greetings to you on this fine Monday evening. It's been a very long day for me, as I'm sure it has been for most of you as well. Thanks to all of you who have put up with my indignance over the last couple of videos. And thank you for your comments, whether they were supportive, negative, or in complete contempt of what I was saying. It's free speech in action, and I think that's a beautiful thing. Quick clarification before we get started. Uh, when I say truth, I mean truth either as I know it to be sometimes, or in some cases just as I best understand it. So it's there for you to take or leave. I do not claim to have a monopoly on truth. Sorry if that sounded arrogant in the last video. So finally, back to the feminism topic. It's been a while, but in uh, part one, if you'll recall, we defined feminism, what it means, what it really means today. Um, in part two, we talked about the differences, the death of distinction between the genders, and how it's happening. In parts three and four, we talked about women sold short and manhood criminalized, how feminism has affected men and women individually, as individuals. Uh, in this video, we're going to be talking about how it affects society as a whole, so the bigger picture. And of course, part five was Confessions of a G.I. Jane, in which I shared um, some personal experiences with double standards. All right, I um, hear from a lot of people who approach the topic of feminism from the viewpoint of feminism at its core is not a bad thing. Uh, it was intended as a good thing, but there are some who radicalize it. And I've always been very tempted to take this stance myself. You know, that it can be a necessary and a good thing, but there are some who take it, and they run with it, and it's corrupted and poisoned. But I can't say that I believe that. From everything that I have studied so far, from just the observations I've made, the little living that I have done, um, 
My observation is that it's the other way around. Feminism at its core, what it really means today, it's a radical concept because the majority of actual feminists, active feminists who know what they believe and why and work to promote the feminist agenda are radical ones. Radical meaning that they're not pro-family, they don't really believe in freedom of choice for women because they aren't okay with the idea of a woman staying home if she wants to and raising her children, and sometimes secretly and often not so secretly, anti-male. So what are some of the results of the feminist agenda being carried out in this country and in the Western world? I don't know about you, but when I look around I see mass confusion. And men and women, it seems to me, don't really know what it is to be their gender. I mean, how do you really define it anymore? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Doesn't society tell us that it's up to your interpretation? Is that right? Should the definition of anything really be up to however the individual decides to define it? Men's and women's roles are being clouded. There's a book called Grave Influence by Brannon House, 21 Radicals and Their Worldviews That Rule America from the Grave. His book is about radical worldviews perpetuated by um, radicals long dead but not gone, living on in areas of society which they've infected. Marx, of course, being one of them and many others. Anyway, he makes a quote about masculinity. Indeed, the average American male has become a feminized wimp. Many may still hunt, fish, and watch football, but that's only a facade of masculinity. Tough guys, quote, end quote, who refuse to lead, to boldly speak truth, to discipline their children, or to take charge are merely whitewashed wimps. All too many men today shun leadership positions that real men would grab a hold of. Likewise, femininity is falling apart. In fact, it's quite under attack. Women are acting less and less like women. The statistics are showing that they're more prone to behavior once attributed mostly to males. Cases of uh, female violence and pedophilia are rising. And many of the young women who do manage to avoid falling into the feminist trap and becoming a feminazi are often pursuing a counterfeit version of femininity, just as young men are pursuing a mere imitation of what it means to be a man. I think this is because young men and women aren't getting young men and young women training. They're getting a collective unisex teenager training. Remember, the differences between the genders is something that's being very much despised. It's not something being championed or held up, and it's certainly not something that boys and girls are uh, being encouraged to aspire to. Now, as the goose-stepping feminazis surge forward, pulverizing everything in their path, there are courageous men standing up and saying, no more of this. They are, of course, MRAs, or men's rights activists. They're part of the men's rights movement, the MRM. Now, this is what I would call definitely a good response to the feminist movement. Most of these men have the wisdom and maturity to meet the feminists on their own turf and not to descend into revenge tactics, although I wouldn't blame them if they did. However, there is another backlash, and uh, backlash is usually an overcorrection. We're seeing this backlash often in men who have been screwed over repeatedly, men who had patience at the beginning and now are giving up, wisely so, I might add. But the men who do this often go too far. And first I want to say that I don't blame them for doing so. It's justified, it's justice. But women, you do not want this. Backlash is often an overcorrection, and many men are overcorrecting. And I would like to say, women, I feel sorry for you. Feminists, uh, I'm really sorry you're going to have to put up with this. But honestly, all I can say is, you deserve it. This is what you asked for. This is what you've been working for. You wanted a man who wouldn't treat you like a woman. Well, guess what? A lot of men are now saying, fine, we're equal. I'm not going to take care of you. I'm not going to protect you. Why should I be the breadwinner? That's what you wanted. You wanted equality, you're going to get it. That means no protection, no chivalry. See, just as John Adams said that our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate to the governance of any other, so chivalry was made for femininity and does not work in relation to anything else. So women are wondering where all the chivalrous men have gone while well, they're pitching their chivalry because you've pitched your femininity. You can't have one and not the other. A lot of men have been embittered. They are the results, they are the product 
of the feminist movement, of the feminist agenda implemented. Screwed over in custody cases, held back when they tried to achieve, told they're of no special value to our society whatsoever, and made out to be idiotic, incompetent buffoons. So who can blame them when they say, I'm going to go my own way? When they say, we don't need women. I mean, come on, you women said that you didn't need men. And I don't know about you, but to me it's really painful to watch the destruction of these gender differences. I'd like to say to men, hang on, hang in there. Not all women are like that. You'll find a good one. They're out there. Don't write all women off as insane. Don't stop being a gentleman. But I can't. Uh, hello, feminists out there. This is a warning. It's already started to happen, and it's only going to get worse. Maybe it was fun telling men that you didn't need them back when you knew that they were still going to be there if it turns out you did need them. Now they're calling your bluff. Er, I'm just saying, provoking someone can't go on forever. You can only tickle the sleeping giant so long before he wakes up. Did you think it just wasn't going to happen? Well, I'll elaborate further sometime when I'm not falling asleep. Next video, which is going to be called What Now, and the last in our feminism series, is going to talk about exactly that. Here's where we are. We're at a crisis point. Now what? What should we then do? What should women do? What should men do? How do we get this thing back on track, if we can? By the way, I don't think we ever will. That's not a reason not to try. Oh, and by the way, the um, nice guys versus bad boys video, which I'm very much looking forward to making, uh, is probably not going to be a part of the feminism series, because it's going to be too long. It's not going to be a series in and of itself. But uh, I really hope to go out and actually, you know, interview some people and take some fun polls and... I really hope to go in depth with that one. So it should be a really fun and hopefully insightful look at that topic. Again, thank you for watching. Wish I could have been more thorough. Really, really, really appreciate your support and even your uh, your criticism because it really actually helps me to stay on track. And uh, I learn a lot from everybody who comments, negative and positive. Oh, and a quick question if I could. Um, when you comment, please add your own opinion on um, how feminism has impacted the Western world for the worse. Big picture wise, how has it affected us? Thank you so much and see you soon. It is Monday, a new week, fresh start, all that jazz. Um, the title of, of this video, of course you already saw it, but is uh, what now? So what now? Where do we go from here? We've already talked about um, uh, feminism, obviously it still affects on society, uh, the many ways in which it is flawed. The things are, we know what the status quo is. The question is, what do we do now? Is there anything to be done? And that's the focus of this video. The man who fell to earth. I really don't want to stay on this topic any longer than necessary, but uh, I got a lot of comments and uh, personal messages from uh, some of you saying, you shouldn't respond to this guy. He's a troll. He's wrong. He's just trying to provoke a response out of you. And I do understand that. First of all, I wanted to forgive the guy, and I wanted him to know um, that that's the way I felt about it. I wanted to use him to prove some of my points, namely the fact that feminists are not pro-women. Feminists are the real misogynists in a strange, twisted sort of way, if you want to look at it that way. He kind of um, proved this in his video. So I don't necessarily intend to make responses to irrational people a habit, but if I see an opportunity, I'm bound to take it, and this is one of them. So um, thanks a bunch for your responses as well. And to anyone else out there who may find my views on feminism nauseating or terrifying, to you I say this. You can't handle the truth! A few things before I get started. Um, I wanted to uh, tell you all about the book The Flip Side of Feminism. I don't know if you can see it there. But anyway, I just received this from my dad for my birthday. It's actually my birthday today. And uh, he knew that I had really wanted the book. And um, I read excerpts from it. And uh, it's just outstanding. It's by Suzanne Venker and uh, Phyllis Schlafly, uh, who is an amazing woman. Um, 
it's amazing what she's put up with and the kind of example and role model that she is for, for all women everywhere. But it's called The Flip Side of Feminism, What Conservative Women Know and Men Can't Say, meaning what men aren't allowed to say. I wanted to read two semi-random uh, letters of feedback that I received, uh, one in the positive and one in the negative. One is from a man who says, Wow, as a man who grew up with two sisters and an extremely feminist mother who spent all the years after my father's death, he died when I was seven, telling me how much of a waste of space men were, it is a pleasure to see someone who talks so much sense. I live in Scotland, which is one of the more old school countries in the world, but more and more we are seeing this we're seeing a whole mess of men and women whose genders are being eroded in the name of God knows what. You put more sense into your words than I've seen in a long time. Thanks for the words of hope. And it's for men like this, as well as all women everywhere, that I speak out against femi feminism. I really have to look no further than my own father and my own brothers to feel a great deal of, uh, of grievous injustice over the kind of world that they have to live in. And certainly the stories that I hear and male acquaintances of mine only prove the point. Next message is actually a channel comment from someone who calls himself Carl Smith 0 Now I ended up blocking this fellow after noticing that he posted much of the same tripe on the walls of fellow female anti-feminists. But he says, you don't even know what feminism is. Where is your solidarity? Okay, beware, because when people start using the word solidarity, they're probably into the Marxist doctrine. He says, do you like voting? Yes, I love voting, and I do it faithfully because I have the opportunity. But if we lived in a time when the man of the house cast the vote for the household, you wouldn't see me pitching a hissy fit. Do you like the fact that you have access to birth control? Ha <laughs> ha, well, considering the fact that the first man I sleep with will be the man that I marry, no, I can't say that I have any use for birth control right now. Oh, how radical! It's, it's, it's unhealthy. It's wrong to suppress those desires. Maybe you just have no sex drive. When you finally do get married, you're going to be sexually retarded. No, I actually have reason to believe that it works the other way. And when you seek pleasure everywhere, you find it nowhere. He says, what is wrong with you? <laughs> well, there are many things wrong with me, but I don't think that my stance on feminism is one of them. You're one of those women who has to pretend to hate feminism in order to get guys to like you. I'm not going to go after that one again. Probably nothing but daddy issues. See, the funny thing is, there is no man on earth who I respect and admire more than my father, and to whom I am closer. He is the man, and I try never to let him forget it. To continue, move to Saudi Arabia and see if you like it. Hilarious thing again there, I have lived in the Middle East, buddy, and actually I found it really refreshing. You have no place online. Every idiot has a place online, so if they're going to put their opinions out there, I'm going to put mine out as well. Thank you. Uh, practice what you preach, otherwise you're just a hypocrite. If anyone would like to point out to me any way in which I'm a hypocrite, I genuinely, sincerely want to hear it. In my last video, um, Backlash, in talking about the response of men to feminism, I forgot to mention one major thing that I'm seeing more and more of. And in fact, when I first joined YouTube, I saw a YouTube channel by a guy named whose channel name was Wisdom Through Logic. And he was talking about his bad experiences with the Western women, specifically American women. He finally came to the conclusion that the West has nothing to offer men as far as women, relationships, marriage. And uh, he wanted to get married. He, I remember in one of his episodes, one of his videos, he held up a passport and said, guys, basically, this is your ticket to sanity, to a decent woman who will respect you. It turns out he did just that. He uh, moved out of the country, married a foreigner, and now has, I think, a couple children, or at least one. And is very, very happy with his marriage. So I'm incredibly happy for him. I'm also incredibly sad that he had to resort to that. Um, it's truly pitiful. It's a shame, but you know, I can't blame him at all. I've actually gotten several messages from guys asking, do you think it would be a, uh, a lack of morals for me to, to go outside the country, to marry a foreigner, um, and ditch the Western woman? And I say, no, absolutely not. It's really too bad. You know, as an American woman, um, I think it's a shame that guys have to look outside this box, this feminist box. But if that's where we are, if that's reality, then there you go. 
I do hope, however, that women will start waking up to the lie that is feminism and that you guys who also realize that the emperor is wearing no clothes will get the kind of woman that you deserve. So what now? I'm declaring a code blue if it has not already been said, and a code blue is a hospital code for a patient which requires immediate resuscitation, usually due to, let's say, a cardiac arrest. Um, they're in dire straits, uh, in a desperate situation, and that's where we are. That's where Western society is when it comes to feminism. It's time to take off the gloves. It's time to come out swinging. I'm not going to, you know, take the completely Ann Coulter approach. I don't believe in insults, and I don't believe in uh, too many generalizations or demonizing and ostracizing the other side. I believe in, instead, convincing them, if it's at all possible. If not, then too bad. But uh, we do what we can, and we do it diplomatically. There are, however, moments for rage, and you've certainly seen me displaying those. Aside from activism and obviously standing up, speaking out against the lie, I think that the biggest voice is the simplest one that you use every day. There's a saying that goes, preach the gospel always, use words when necessary. Obviously that's in relation to Christianity, the gospel. But I think it applies here as well. What you do, the way you live, the way you act, speaks a lot louder than what you say. For the women out there embracing your femininity, for the men out there embracing your masculinity, that speaks more in this androgynous unisex world than all the debating ever could sometimes. To women I say the following, examine yourselves, watch your attitude, start asking yourself a very important question and that is why. The next time you're tempted to male bash right along with your uh, female friends, ask yourself why you're doing it. Ask yourself what you are accomplishing aside from making yourself feel better and not really that. Ask yourself, what are the results of this? Is this demeaning men really going to turn them into the kind of men that you respect and love to interact with? Or is it just going to tear them down? Also, changing male behavior and thinking, unless you are a mom with sons, is not up to you. Um, you are, however, influential as women. Men will react to the way you act. Uh, the way you think, the way you dress, they all affect men. Whether it's for the better or for the worse is up to you. Something as simple and supposedly unimportant as how you dress. This is just an example. Girls these days do not know how to dress femininely and attractively without being sexy not saying there's any there's something inherently wrong with being sexy time and place people um, it's the difference between looking like a flower and looking like a sandwich to quote my dad my daughters are allowed to look pretty in public they are not allowed to look sexy that's what he said when I was growing up he said the difference is that one of them makes you just want to look the other makes you want to take a bite the man is profound and full of wisdom like this respect men who embrace masculine virtues appreciate them um, work with them instead of finding yourself embattled with them all the time. Men, I know you're in a difficult position, sometimes an impossible position, but I say grab those leadership opportunities by the horns. Yeah, you're going to be going against the system, uh, and it's a daily, sometimes hourly fight, but that is where we are. And it's not a fair fight. Injustice is the word of the day. You're going to lose a lot of these battles in the workplace, for example. There's no reason not to fight. I know it's easy for me to say, but uh, the feminists need to know that you're out there and that you're, you have not been silenced. You may not win the battle, but they need to know that you're still going to put up the fight. Trust me, it makes them think twice, whether they admit it or not. Also, I would exhort you to encourage women who stand against feminism, and uh, don't give the time of day to those who don't. Both genders need to come to the realization that uh, appreciation and respect for the opposite sex is something that has been completely lost, something that we need to bring back. And truly some of the biggest battles are the ones that you fight daily. You know, the, the situation where someone says something wrong, something anti-male, and you step up and you speak out against it. You may not win that argument. They need to know that not everyone is drinking the Kool-Aid.
If the good people sit down and they don't say anything, everyone then assumes that the radical feminist tripe is the word of the day. That is how it is. That is reality when it is not. As Abraham Lincoln said, to sin by silence when they should protest makes cowards of the best of men, and women for that matter. But the point of this is to encourage those of you who have been fighting the good fight to continue on, and those of you who have sat by in apathy to stand up and let your voice be counted. I can tell you right now that it's not going to make you popular, except among the right kinds of people. I've talked a significant amount in previous videos about uh, the media's portrayal of um, males in general, um, especially men, grown men, and um, they always make you know women and children out to be the geniuses and men out to be the uh, the idiots, the stumbling, bumbling buffoons who would never survive if not for the witty input of their girlfriends, wives, children, what have you. Now there's a quote that goes, future generations will look back on TV as the lead in the water pipes that slowly drove the Romans mad. Uh, certainly nothing illustrates that better than the following commercial. Uh, I want to say it makes me angry, but really it makes me more sad than, than anything. That is awesome. Look how fast that is. So it's kind of encyclopedia-ish. It is an encyclopedia. Hellish. Tom, I thought you were going to wash the dog. Yes. Uh, she's working on a school project. I'm kind of helping her out. Tom, leave her alone. Tom! This TV commercial was actually pulled from the air by Verizon um, under pressure from um, his side which is a men's rights organization led by activist Glenn Sachs. The campaign against the ad was endorsed by countless psychologists and uh, family counselors, I think, um, because of the ad's denigration of fathers and men in general. Certainly, there are plenty of other commercials, practically every other commercial out there, like this one, that stay on the air, that people find funny. But the fact is, this one did get pulled off the air due to the vigilance and the perseverance of activists and people who cared enough to do something about it. So please let that be an encouragement to you that uh, there is progress, things do happen, one voice does count. Sometimes all it takes is one voice. So thank you again for watching and uh, for being involved, for putting your popularity on the line, and I will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. I realize it was a lot to sit through it was always an awfully long video, especially for my standards, but uh, it was really it's, it was really important for me to do this, especially since Chris Hill Misty had a lot of really good points to present, like a lot of good arguments to bring to the table. And I, I, I realize that Chris Hill Misty isn't gonna possibly be watching this, but if I some off miracle that uh, she does, I do have one thing to say. I do sincerely hope that you return to YouTube and can you do some of your awesome stuff, Christiana. Like, I'm well aware that the um, videos brought you some, like, unwanted attention as, well, some people have put it, <laughs> to be frank. But, um... Yeah, your feminism series is by far like the best videos I've seen on YouTube, especially covering the topic of feminism. Like, I sincerely mean that. Like, it really is. So, here's hoping that you return to your stuff on YouTube and you continue to make videos. Well, then, I guess that's it. Thank you so much for watching, especially up to this point, up to the end. That really means a lot. Peace out, guys.